presents the best. And the worst. I mean, the dog of 1983. Well, that was a little fanfare heralding what we think are the 10 best films and the 10 worst films, The Dogs, this past year. I'm Neil Gabler. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. On this special sneak preview, as we'll look back at the year we spent at the movies in 1983, Neil and I somehow spent nearly 700 hours in dark screening rooms. We'll salute our choices for the 10 best movies of the year and take one last chance to vent our anger, disappointment, and maybe even our outrage at the 10 Dogs of 83, the absolutely worst movies of the year. Neil leads off now with his choices for the best films he saw in 1983. Well, you know, Jeffrey, as in most years, it was much easier to come up with the 10 best list than to narrow the dogs down to a 10 worst list. And here are my 10 best. My number 10 well, choice is The Return of Martin Gere, a medieval mystery from France about a man who may not be who he says he is. It brilliantly recreates the period, and even better, it's suspenseful. Il savait les moments où j'aimais jouir de lui. Et les mots que j'aimais entendre avant, pendant et après. Number nine is Local Hero, a Scottish comedy about how a small village reacts to the prospect of an oil refinery. Its whimsy and its wistfulness are enchanting. He wants to sell me the sand? No, sir, you get the drift if he does it. Well, don't worry about it, Maggie. Hi, Elijah. My number eight film is The King of Comedy, General, Martin Scorsese's black comedy Jerry. with Robert De Niro okay. kidnapping Jerry Lewis to get on Lewis's TV show. Ah, Few boy, films better I, capture our obsession with celebrity. Back from a tour, I don't know what it is, but there must be something in the air or the tour. It really becomes you. It's like you become rejuvenated. I don't know what it is. Isn't that so, everybody? Isn't that so? Number seven is Yentl, the musical with Barbara Streisand masquerading as a man to get an education. The music is horrible, but Streisand's vulnerability gives Yentl real feeling. No trouble. Yes, no bother. No carrots? No, thank you. Number six is Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander, about one family's indomitable spirit in turn-of-the-century Sweden. Funny, nostalgic, warm, and even magical, it's full of wisdom and compassion. <laughs> Number five is Risky Business, the comedy about a teenager who turns his house into a bordello. It's very funny, but its real achievement is that it captures the desperate spirit of success-crazed America. I just want my egg back. I want my house back. I I've got a lot of work to do. Did you have a good time last night? Number four is Star 80, the true story of slain Playboy playmate Dorothy Stratton. With a feverish performance by Eric Roberts as Stratton's husband, it manages to be both horrifying and sympathetic. Things will change for you. <laughs> what, you mean maybe I'll grow up to be a big movie director? Or own a big magazine? Is that what you mean? And number three is Educating Rita with Michael Caine as a disillusioned professor and Julie Walters as his eager student. Wonderfully acted and wonderfully written, it makes you laugh and cry. What is your name? Me first name? Well, that would at least constitute some sort of start, wouldn't it? Well, here's a quick recap of my top ten. In the number ten position, it's The Return of Martin Gere. Number nine, Local Hero. Number eight, The King of Comedy. Number seven, Yentl. Number six, Fanny and Alexander. Number five, Risky Business. Number four, Star. Number three, Educating Rita. And number two, well, for me, there is no number two because there's a tie for first place. And I'll be telling you about those later in the program. You really put King of Comedy on your best films list, didn't you? Yes, man? I did. Okay, now let's look at my 10 best list. The Gray Fox is 10th on my list of best movies for 83. It's an understated western about an old highwayman just released from prison, coping with a new century and its new ways. The Gray Fox never glamorized the old man, it just beautifully humanized him. You see uh, seafaring man, Bill? Pardon? Well, I just noticed that. Uh, I've never been to see. What kind of work do you do, Bill? Well, I'm between jobs right now. Number nine is War Games, about a high school student who accidentally triggers the countdown to nuclear right. Armageddon with his home computer. It was devilishly real, frighteningly plausible. Shall we play a game? Let's play. Global thermonuclear war. Fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
from Spain came Carmen in eighth position, about a flamenco choreographer consumed by his work, passionately in love with his leading lady. Carmen pulsated, and the dancing was sizzling. The return of Martin Gare makes my list, too, in seventh place. An enchanting little fable. Not until the movie's very end do we really know who he is. It was delightfully beguiling. Il savait les moments où j'aimais jouir de lui. Et les mots que j'aimais entendre, avant, pendant, et après. Director Ingmar Bergman's last film, he says, Fanny and Alexander is on my list as well in the number six slot. I only hope Bergman will change his mind and decide to keep making wonderful movies. <laughs> Number five on my list belongs to the inspiring Testament about people in a small town coping after a nuclear holocaust. Testament enough. was never maudlin nor mawkish, just a study of courage and hope. I'm running away. I hate fighting. Sexton's gonna do it for you, right? Number four on my list was director Sidney Lumet's sobering Daniel about the children of the Rosenberg spies. The performances were riveting, and I had my heart in my mouth. And now it's revolution! Oh, revolution! I thought we did that! I thought we'd been through that! They seldom make movies as intelligent as Educating Rita, my number three. Julie Walters was the student, Michael Caine her teacher. This was a provocative story about life's possibilities. What is your name? Me first name. Well, that would at least constitute some sort of start, wouldn't it? My runner-up movie is Tender Mercies, with Robert Duval as a washed-up country music singer. His character and the movie showed courage and a beautiful sense of a man's making the best of life. What happened to your money? I lost it. How? How? Too much Applejack. Summarizing my choices for best movies of the year, numbers 10 through 2, I chose The Grey Fox, War Games, Carmen, The Return of Martin Gare, Fanny and Alexander, Testament, Daniel, Educating Rita, and Tender Mercies. You know, it strikes me, Jeffrey, looking at both of these lists, that very few of these films were big commercial successes. You really had to go out and search for movies this year of quality. One of the reasons, I think, is because they dealt with difficult, sobering subject matters. Star 80 on your list, Testament and Daniel on my list. These are not commercial subjects for movies, not big box office People hits. go to the movies to be entertained Young this year, as they always do. And I think they're beginning to define entertainment in a very narrow way. Entertainment is something that makes you feel good, not something that challenges you, not something that saddens you. And I think that that is reflected in the list of commercial successes this year, but not in the list of, of films that we have as the best of the year. Which are still being made, films still being made primarily to appeal to a young audience. Yes, absolutely, and they don't want to be challenged. Well, now let's move on to the dogs of the year. I'm really sorry I had to exclude worthy nominees like Exposed, Eddie and the Cruisers, and Staying Alive, but here are the ten movies I think are the ten absolute dogs of the year. Number 10 is Betrayal, adapted from Harold Pinter's play about a love triangle. Despite two fine performances, it's a film only intellectuals could love, which means it's boring, boring, boring. I've always liked Jerry. To be honest, I've always liked him rather more than I've liked you. Number nine is Rumblefish, Francis Coppola's artsy epic about misunderstood teenagers. Trying to create visual poetry, he winds up creating doggerel. You always try so hard to be like your brother, Mr. James. Hey, my brother's the coolest. Well, you're better than cool. You're warm. Yeah, but... Number eight is Going Berserk, an alleged comedy with three stars from SCTV. It's right behind Bamboo Under the Fingernails on the Geneva Convention's list of tortures. My husband smoked, you know. He died from smoking too much. I thought you said he died because he was fat. I can assure Speaking you. Speaking of alleged comedies, number seven is Dr. Detroit with Dan Aykroyd. You can count the funny lines not only on one hand, but on one finger. Extensively read in white crane kung fu and a pedo. Dog number six is class, which would have you believe that a grown woman, Jacqueline Bissett, could mistake a pimply teenager for a man of the world. Randy, I love elevators. I think they're just wonderful. That's the way to go. Up and down. My number five dog is Superman 3, which manages to embarrass Richard Pryor and bore us. You know there's something wrong when Christopher Reeve is the best thing in a movie. Hi. Superman? That's me. Number four is a French import called The Moon in the Gutter. It should have been called Film in the Gutter. 
It's pretentious junk like this that gives foreign movies a bad name. Is it the moon that is with Number three is Deal of the Century, with Chevy Chase as an arms dealer. If there were mercy killing for movies, someone should have pulled the plug on this one. Is that you, Ray? Hey! Is that you, Ed? So is this for real? Are you gonna blow up the arms? Sure, or what? That's right, Ed! And I want Number two is Stroker Ace. What Burt Reynolds does to humiliate girlfriend Lonnie Anderson, the Washington Redskins wouldn't do to the Dallas Cowboys. And of course, it's my job to travel with you to make sure everything is properly arranged. Travel with me? Uh-huh. Well, here's Brandy to help me announce my number one dog of the year. Now, what makes a film the dog of the year? Well, it has to be stupid, of course, and boring, and sloppily made, and insulting, a waste of time, if not talent. But most of all, it has to be offensive. And I don't think there was a more offensive movie this year than Easy Money with Rodney Dangerfield. No one scene can possibly convey the film's constant vulgarity, but try this one. Can somebody help us here? I don't think so. I'll tell you, my friend here, he's looking... I'll tell you, my friend here, he's looking for a shirt. Yeah, uh, you have something in the dark black. Yeah, he wants something he can wear four or five days in a row. You have any men's shirts for men? Have you tried the Army-Navy store? Oh, very funny, huh? One more word out of you and he gets it, all right? Come on. <laughs> Where you going? It says come in and browse. Uh -huh. May I help you? No, thank you. Just browsing. Hey, what do I got in this place? Antiques? No, those are the customers. May I help you? Oh, no, thanks, sir. Uh, just browsing. How long do you intend to browse? Well, that lady there, you didn't ask her how long she intends to browse. How come you're asking us how long we intend to browse? You don't look like browsers. Dangerfield can't stand still. Actually, neither could I. <laughs> Easy Money is not only vulgar, boorish, anti-intellectual, and ignorant, it's a celebration of those things. You know how prisoners mark off the days they have left to serve? Well, that's how I felt about every minute of Easy Money. Well, now here's a quick recap of my dogs of 1983. Avoid them at all costs. In the number 10 position, Betrayal. Number nine, Rumblefish. Number eight, Going Berserk. Number seven, Dr. Detroit. Number six, Class. Number five, Superman three. Number four, The Moon in the Gutter. Number three, Deal of the Century. Number two, Stroker Ace. And number one, Easy Money. Well, Neil, I too sat through some real clinkers in 1983. Now, reluctantly omitting your up in smoke, two of a kind of Hercules, I saw 10 movies which had brandy foaming at the mouth as well. I nearly called a vet for a rabies shot. Tenth on my list of worst movies of 83 is Porky's 2, another mindless Teenagers in Heat movie. I wonder what he's up to. Ninth on my dog list was Stroker Race, another of those brainless Burt Reynolds tush and tire movies. Stroker Race is a shameful, sad exploitation of women. And, of course, it's my job to travel with you to make sure everything is properly arranged. Travel with me? Uh-huh. Slithering up the ladder to position number eight was Superman 3, a needless sequel to a sequel. With the world in peril, I actually began rooting for the bad guy. Hi. Firmly in seventh place was Tales of Ordinary Madness with Ben Gazzara as a zonked out underground poet. It was the sleaziest movie of the year. As long as you don't die on me. Videodrome number six was just plain disgusting, a cruel fantasy about the possibilities of video technology. Videodrome turned my stomach. Fifth position are the five 3D movies I endured in 83, including this one, Amityville 3D. 3D, all right, dumb, dopey, and depressing. The Star Chamber, about rogue judges meeting out their own justice outside the law, is number four. It shamefully twists the legal system for cheap exploitation. I 
Number three is the idiotic Dr. Detroit with Dan Aykroyd about a schnook who dons a secret identity. I remember the endless wait for something remotely amusing. I am extensively read in white crane kung fu and... Aikido! Uh, Rodney Dangerfield won't ever get any respect from anyone who endured easy money, my number two. Changing Rodney from a lovable schnook to a churlish lout wasn't funny, just nasty. Do you have any men's shirts for men? Have you tried the Army-Navy store? Oh, very funny, huh? One more word out of you and he gets it, all right? Come on. <laughs> Here's Brandy back again, still hungry to bark at a dog of the year, with my absolute worst movie of 1983. It's Staying Alive, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever. This time, Tony Manero, played by John Travolta, the amateur disco dancer, has somehow learned to dance professionally for Broadway musicals. This loud, boring, heavy-handed movie tells the uninteresting story of his trials and tribulations. But director Sylvester Stallone must have thought we were fascinated by this character. I wasn't. Well, did you know that we was going to have an audition here tomorrow? I told you that a week ago. Really? Yeah. Maybe I wasn't paying attention. You're going to audition, aren't you? Why not? Rejection's become like a hobby to me now. Oh, listen to you. <laughs> More well Good night. Good night. Good night. Smell what? Uh, do you know her? Just informally. Well, how'd you meet her? She was passing by before. I told her she was an OK dancer. Oh, that's incredible. You tell her she's an OK dancer. <laughs> Something to that effect. She's a great dancer. I can't believe you said it. Well, what about the limo? Whose is it? I think it belongs to her. Everybody says that she comes from money. Really? Mm -hmm. what, just what's her name? Is she, like, heavily involved with someone or what? I don't know. What do you mean by involved? You know, it's like she got a lot of guys hanging around, drooling over, you know. Look, if you're hot over somebody, I don't want to always hear about it. I just respect the dancing, that's all. Yeah. Did you hear the way she talks? It's so intelligent, like, I love it. An accent doesn't make someone intelligent. If it did, you'd be Einstein. What wonderful dialogue. I hope they never stop jabbering. <laughs> Staying Alive was overly impressed with itself. It had a musical score to burn your ears off and showed that even a charismatic actor like John Travolta will flop miserably if the screenplay has two left feet, has nothing to say, and adds absolutely nothing new to his character. And Stallone must have never seen a Broadway show for his presentation of a Broadway musical looked more like a police raid on a speakeasy. Staying Alive should have been called Staying Awake, and it's my number one dog of 1983. Summarizing my choices now for dogs of 83, from top to bottom, is Porky's 2 and all similar movies for that matter, Stroker Race, Superman 3, Tales of Ordinary Madness, Videodrome, any and all 3D <laughs> movies, The Star Chamber, Dr. Detroit, Easy Money, and my choice for dog of the year, Staying Alive. I happen to like Star Chamber. That's the only one that I take exception to no, on that you, list. You really did? Yes, I did. But you know, usually I don't like to pick on small fry movies like these that have been on our Dogs of the Year list. I usually like big, boring, pretentious movies, but the fact of the matter is that there weren't that many ambitious movies this year. Yeah, I felt, use the word betrayal for one of your movies, I felt betrayed by some of these movies. Rodney Dangerfield, whom I ordinarily adore, turns up in a piece of just trash like that movie that he was in, Easy Money, and even Chevy Chase, whom I like, turned up on a dog list on your list. I really felt betrayed by these people because I expected much more out of them. Lots of failed comedies, too. If you look at the list, lots of failed comedies because I think Hollywood executives think that teenagers want comedies, they're indiscriminate, and you can throw anything on the screen and teenagers will go for it. I have a little bit more respect for teenagers and I think that the list of this year's best comedies even shows that teenagers are responding to movies like Mr. Mom, Trading Places, uh, National Lampoon's Vacation, which at least have a structure to them. They're not just sloppy. Yeah, it was good to see some of the choices that I might have omitted on your list, like The Moon in the Gutter, which I absolutely <laughs> hated. Good for you for putting we that on. We could go on and on oh, with the worst movies of the year, absolutely. but now to the best film of the year. I really agonized over my choice for best picture of the year. I went back to see these films again, but I cannot pick one over the other, so I have two best pictures of the year. You can call me a chicken, I guess. Going alphabetically, the first is Tender Mercies, a soft, subtle drama starring Robert Duvall as a one-time country singing star and reformed alcoholic. Trying to pull his life together, Duvall settles in a small Texas town and courts a young widow with a son. In this scene, which is typical of the film's realism and ease, he reluctantly tells the widow about his past. Turn off the TV, Sonny, and get to bed. You got school tomorrow. I'll talk with you all a little bit first. No, sir. Good night. Good night. 
Good night. Good little fella. Yeah, he's grown up so fast, he'll be gone before I even know it. You have any other family? Uh, no. I was the only kid my mom and daddy had. They had me kind of late in life. My daddy's been dead. Well, we died two years after my husband was killed. And Mama died a year and a half ago last spring. My mom and daddy are dead, too. But I have a brother out in California someplace. We lost track of each other. I have a daughter. You do? She's seven or eight years older than you, boy. Where is she? With her mama. Me and her mama are divorced. We belong too well, I reckon my... But you all stop talking, I can't get to sleep. <laughs> Robert Duvall is just astonishing. Although it doesn't knock you off your seat, Tender Mercies is exactly what its title says it is. It's a film about ordinary people coming to terms with their lives by enduring the bad and looking for the good. And coming to terms is also the theme of my other best picture of the year. It's Terms of Endearment. I really adore Tender Mercies, too. It's a good choice on your part, Neil, but I'm Thank glad you. you included <laughs> Terms of Endearment, too, because Terms of Endearment just happens to be my choice for the best picture of 1983. It was made by first-time director James Brooks, who co-wrote the screenplay. He showed the evolution of a family over several decades, in particular the complex relationship between a quirky mother, played by Shirley MacLaine, coming to grips with drastic changes in her life, and her daughter, feisty and independent, portrayed by Deborah Winger. Terms of endearment got through to the very souls of its characters. You lived and died with them. And here, the daughter comes home to her mother. later. They're probably tired anyway. It'll get to sleep early, and uh, I'd like to get to bed early. <laughs> Grandma! 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 <laughs> Terms of, wasn't that a beautiful it scene? Sure is. Terms of Endearment was a very special movie because it explored emotions which were so real and believable you felt for those characters. They were like a part of your family. By the time the daughter, for instance, faced her greatest challenge in life, you came to know her and to care very deeply about her. In fact, I was genuinely sorry to see Terms of Endearment end because I felt I was saying goodbye to the people with whom I'd spent a part of my life. That's a very special, very rare feeling you get in the movie, and that's why this picture was my number one. I love Terms of Endearment, but you know, this really wasn't a very good year for movies. No, it wasn't. I think in the long eye of movie history, it's not going to be considered a very important year. If anything, the best thing that happened in 1983 was that there were so many impressive debuts. James Brooks, who directed Terms of Endearment. Julie Walters in Educating Reader. Yeah, uh, Paul Brickman, who directed Risky Business, and Philip Borses, who directed The Gray Fox. That's very hopeful, but for me also, hopefully, was the sign that three of the pictures on our list, Educating Reader, Terms of Endearment, and Tender Mercies, were movies which took chances. They, some of them were not about really big things. They were about little things, but they got you so involved mm -hmm. and caring. They weren't made with a huge box office in mind. No, and yet, I think we have to admit that probably the most important movie in 1983 was a film that's on neither of our lists, and that's Flashdance. Never be on which, our list. No. Which, but it, yeah, important because it, it leads to other, other movies of that type being It's made. going to have enormous influence, I think, for the next few years. I think that studio executives are going to look at Flashdance, and they're going to say, look, you really don't need characters, you really don't need plot, all you need is slick filmmaking style and some music, and, and the audience will go for but it. But as for me, I, I hope they keep making movies about little things that are not seemingly important at the beginning, but which grow on you, so that by the end of the film, as we saw in three of these best films, you really walk out of there exhilarated. You'll never get it from Flashdance for a picture from me. No, you're not going to get that from Flashdance. Well, here's a last look at what I feel, I guess so you can memorize it, are the 10 <laughs> best movies from 1983. Number 10 is The French Mystery, The Return of Martin Gere. Number 9 is Local Hero, a Scottish comedy. 
Number eight is The King of Comedy with Robert De Niro. Number seven is Barbara Streisand's Yentl. Number six is Fanny Alexander from Swedish director Ingmar Bergman. Number five is Risky Business, the teenage comedy. Number four is the horrifying Star 80. Number three is the delightful comedy drama Educating Rita. And in a dead heat, tied for number one, Terms of Endearment and Tender Mercies. Come on, pick one. Just I me. cannot pick one. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, Neil, those were your favorites. And here again are my choices for the best movies in national release in 1983. Starting from number 10, the understated western The Gray Fox. Number 9 is War Games, the fun movie hit of the summer. Number 8 is The Sizzling Carmen. Number 7, The Beguiling Fable, The Return of Martin Gare. Number 6, director Ingmar Bergman's delightful Fanny and Alexander. Number 5 is the sobering movie Testament. Number 4, The Riveting Daniel. Number 3, The Intelligent, Provocative, Educating Rita. Number 2, The Touching, Courageous, Tender Mercies. And my choice for the best picture of the year, the deeply engrossing Terms of Endearment which I said win the Oscar for Best Picture Absolutely. of the Year. Well, that's it for this special look at our best and worst films of 1983. Of course, we're hoping 1984 will bring even better films and fewer dogs. So until next week, don't forget to save us the aisle seats.